Okay, so we have this situation. Uh, vector V runs from 3, 2 to 8, 5. Well, it's just the picture of right down the information in the order we see it. V equals 8 minus 3i plus 5 minus 2j. If I do my arithmetic correctly, it's 5i plus 3j. Right? Do we agree? Whatever we got. Okay. Um, then V plus W equals R. R is negative I plus 6J. So So here's R minus V, right? And there are various ways you can do it. You can figure out what the coordinates of this point are to be 1, 8, right? So if you want to say that, what's 1, 8, and then from here to here, right? But I'm going to do it algebraically because sometimes you got to do that. Okay. So W is R minus V. And of course, the algebra should fit the picture, uh, which is. Um, Section in the J I said J, but okay. Uh, and then I'll be formal by the distributive law. It's made one plus five I plus six plus three J. These laws apply to electricians as well as they do to motors and signals and stuff. And that's going to be four I. Plus nine J. Now you know what these numbers are. I think we'll see that one. Um, so if you see me do something, write down a bad number or something, just kind of raise your hand and look a little cross eyed and I'll figure it out. Okay. Um, now we can check that. Okay. Uh, what did I do wrong? I did something terribly wrong here. You want to tell me what it was? So I was writing it down in a hurry and I wrote something down that absolutely didn't match what I should have written down. Okay, now I made it, you know, I really made the mistake. Okay, I said R minus V and then I wrote R plus V because I was just looking in the symbols and stuff without thinking about what it meant. So I wrote this down. Then I knew I'd better check it with the picture because I'm prone to do that stuff. And so are you. Probably not as prone as I am, but you're still prone to make errors. So you want to see it at least two ways to make sure you got it right. Okay? And it makes no sense. This point would have an X component of 2. Okay? From 8 over to 2 is negative 6. It's not 4. So right away I knew there was something wrong, and right away I saw what it was. Okay, is it just so far off? And it's clearly not nine units in the J direction, in the Y direction, from here up to here. It's not even nine units long. And it started here above the X axis. It's not going to end up there. Okay, so I should have written minus parentheses around it. We should change this to a minus. And change this to a minus. And then I would get better numbers. And we get negative 6i plus 3j. And that checks because this point would be 2, 8. From 5 up to 8 is 3. From 8 over 2 is negative 6. And everything checks. So make sure you see all that when you do these. Okay? And make sure you see it two ways. Yeah, there are other ways to check. But there's a geometric check, and there's an algebraic calculation. Must have done something wrong. Somebody's got something. Okay, now there was an objection there, and it would be okay if R was from the origin. If R was rooted at the origin, 
then this point would have been negative one six. But these aren't the coordinates at this point. So you see it. I think it was your paper. I saw that on minor, easily corrected. But make sure you know where you are on the plane. Okay. Uh, okay, so there we have it. There's W. Well, the magnitude of W is easy. That's straightforward. Everybody knows that. And if you have the wrong numbers in there, you know why, but you know how to get them back to n theta. Inverse tangent of, let's see, we're doing the magnitude, we're doing W, yep. Yeah. It's the inverse tangent of. Three over negative six plus 180 degrees. Because the inverse tangent gives you an angle between negative pi over two and pi over two between negative 90 degrees and positive 90 degrees. It doesn't give you a second quadrant angle. If the x component is negative, you're going to have to add 180 degrees or pi radians, depending on which system you're working in. So make sure you make a note of that because it's not going to make sense. If you say that that angle is, um, what is it? It's about 150 degrees. If you say it's you know, negative 30 degrees, it's wrong. Okay? It's, it's not exactly 30. That equals whatever comes out of your calculator because it's not an angle that you can easily express in terms of simple angles. Okay? Um, it's not, it's not an inverse tangent. Usually the inverse tangent, except from inverse tangent of 45 or 90 or zero degrees, is, is uh, or 30 or 60, okay? It's not a special angle, and that's not, uh, you're kind of stuck using calculator. Um, I'm just writing this off, the plus 180 degrees wouldn't be bad, if you punch that out and get the actual angle, you're going to find it's not the right angle. Okay. So to give you a fourth quadrant angle, where that's a second. Okay. Uh, so there you got all that. So all that's very straightforward. If you didn't get the details, of this, and you'll get them next time. Not particularly difficult. Okay. Uh, and, and neither is this, but just. Uh, angle between W oh. and between W and B Something you're going to use a lot. So theta is the inverse cosine of what? V dot W. Well, it's really easy to calculate. Um, here's V. And, oh, okay. Here's W. Here's V. Negative 1 times 5 is negative 5. 6 times 3 is 18. But it's going to be inverse cosine of 13. Magnitude of W is 3 square root of 5 times uh, magnitude of V, which is square root of 34. And that end will come up okay because it gives you the closest thing. Okay. So, 
Any question on that? Does that look right? I think the numbers are right. They are, but it doesn't make sense, okay? This number down here better be bigger than this number up here. This is three times the square root of 170. Square root of 170 is below 13. So this is like five times 13, three times 13. So that'd be the inverse cosine pretty close to one third. Okay. Looks like that angle should be bigger. So I would check that out. First of all, my mental calculation. Okay. Is being halfway mental anyway, my mental calculations aren't always right, but I think that one might be pretty close. Okay, but if it is, then you like the way I've drawn those vectors. So and the end looks much bigger than that. Be less than 30 degrees, be about you know, 20 degrees or so. And that, I think it's bigger than that. Okay, so I'll put a big question mark here. You can resolve it, but this is how we count. Make sense? Okay. And do you have any questions on the homework that was due for today? Okay, question is, what does the data look like? This thing is rotating at 90 degrees per count, right? So, well, it would look like this. Consistently have to check every four counts because a count corresponds to the single end, the one end that we chose of the beam pointing at you, and it takes 360 degrees to complete that, right? So that's what it would look like. Now, if it was 60 degrees per count, well, you'd have three of these. Oh, you have 60, so no, yeah, 60 degrees per count is um, these what we got, um, 76 counts. Okay, and 30 degrees per count. You know, like 12 of these, right? Okay. Now, how do you tell, since your data doesn't exactly look like that, as you're transitioning from like three counts per cycle to four counts per cycle? Sometimes you're going to get a four, and sometimes you're going to have a three, right? So you're going to pretty much have fours and threes, and pretty soon it'll settle down to where you pretty much have fours, but then pretty soon you're going to be start seeing some fives, right? Make sense? Okay. So, question was, how long from the time it hits this? Till it stops. Okay. How long from the time it hits this until it stops? Okay. Now I'm going to actually change the question a little bit because I didn't get really consistent answers. Okay. But I, I got some that looked pretty good. Uh, but I didn't get them from everybody. So to make it a little easier to see, I'm going to say instead of 90 degrees per count will do 180 degrees per count, 120 degrees per count, 60 degrees per count. Okay. 60 degrees per count will be a little easier to see than 30 degrees per count. Just for 30 degrees, you have to have like 12 of these between your check marks. And it, it happened before it stopped. Now, the question is <clears throat> well, 
let's say, yeah. oh yeah, another thing. I do want you to write out your thinking, okay? But then I want you to summarize yeah. it so I can see it. I don't want to have to read several paragraphs. I didn't have any trouble reading handwriting. It was fine. Uh, except it takes longer to read, and I want to be able to get the information quickly like at the beginning of the class. So I think uh, a table or a graph or something would be a quick way to report, a, a way I could spot right away and see what the results are. And then if something looks a little weird, I go back and read your words. That makes sense. So kind of take a lesson on that and see, uh, and, and come in with that plus some other stuff. And I'll, I'll tell you shortly what that other stuff is because it's pretty simple. Um, actually, there, there are, I don't know, probably about 14 numbered steps, but most of them are really simple. Okay. The hardest one is interpreting what I meant when I asked for this information. Okay. And if you've got this information for the 90, 60, and 30, include it. If you can, include it, but then go ahead and add this. Okay. Make sense? I'll, I'll, I'll kind of write that out. Hopefully, I'll be able to do that this afternoon so you can read it. And we've got a question, Taylor. Maybe if I dance a little jig. But what I what I might expect to see might be a table. Um, Very succinct. That makes sense. Then I can see immediately whether this is linear or not. Is this linear? Okay, so 140 counts, 90 counts, 45 counts for rest, 90, 60, 30. This is these are these are linear. Okay. This is three times this, this is two times this, this is this. Okay. The change is the same. You're always changing by 30 degrees per count. Now, your estimate of where that happens is going to be the same as anybody else's. Your data is going to look a little different because either you observed a different system or you observed it from a different angle. Okay. And there might be a couple of counts between what you observe and what somebody else observes. But uh, still, at some point, you're going to have 90, you're going to have 60, you're going to have 30. You judge where that's most likely to have occurred. Okay? And you can explain to me how you judged it, but then show it on the table. Now, if the table looks like this, Okay, I'll call this change in omega and change in counts to rest, right? So change in omega is 30 degrees per count each time. And the change in counts to rest is
50 and then 45. Okay. Now, if you were to route this information, And how do I want to grab this? Okay. Okay. There's the deeply space along the number line and thirty sixty nine. Then you got these three points, right? That makes sense. And that looks pretty clear. <clears throat> All right. Now more sophisticated way other than just looking at your data and I want you to do it by looking at your data so I want you to really understand what the data is saying okay but the other way of doing it is to take your raw data which this is raw data and these are inferred from raw data right so let's make note of that this inferred support Now, the count for rest is transcribed from your inference of when these happen, and that's just you're transcribing it. You're just seeing how many counts it takes to get to rest at each point. Um, if we do theta versus T, then Theta and T are transcribed to raw data, there's no interpretation involved. So this is as close as you get to raw data. Put that raw data into Excel and get a graph. Anybody know how to do that? It's really straightforward. If you're not sure, follow that. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, one, one thing like to have in this which is a projector and a screen you know i can't have a projector and a screen and have this actually i kind of can but the projector does look well on a black surface so i have to have a screen you know, you see uh because i could just occasionally send it out from software and, and, and demonstrate it but I, i'm assuming this very basic Excel skills where you can plot the data and do the trend line. And we talked about that. <laughs> you already have done hand graphs. You know what this looks like. You've actually done a hand graph and drawn a curve. So you can kind of tell from a hand graph if it's carefully drawn. Well, how would you determine from a hand graph? Or you're hitting 90 degrees per count. Okay, so I had a suggestion. One was use the trend line. Uh, and actually, when I responded to that, I was thinking you were thinking the itself trend line, but this is a trend line. And you could use that trend line. I think maybe that's what you actually were talking about. Okay. Uh, but The one thing that I was kind of looking for and finally heard was slope. Where's the slope of this thing? 90 degrees per count. Well, if your time here is 
150 counts. And your theta here is 3,000 degrees. Okay. Then, just for example, start with this line here would be. Hundred degrees per count. Every case kind of reference slope, right? Because the rise is three thousand degrees, the run is one hundred and fifty counts. You divide that out, and I think you get two hundred. No, no, actually, it's probably really wrong. You get twenty. Okay. So. Thought that was a little odd. Hallucinating too many zeros. Okay. Hey, I can do it, I can too. So 30 degrees per count probably be up about here. Okay, and it just turns out that looks like it's tangent to the curve right about there, right? It doesn't have to be tangent to the curve. It actually Shouldn't be if it's done accurately because this line would go through the origin and so would the curve. Okay, but you know you can you can kind of see where it is. Okay, seems so graphic. Can you make a pretty good estimate and say, okay, well that's that changes the curve. That's 150. That's about 75. That's about 40. Well, that would be my estimate if you have a carefully drawn graph. You don't have to be too artistic or anything. I say just slop down a hand drawn graph that's got a reasonably consistent scale and make an estimate. All right, well, I'm kind of belaboring that a lot, but what I'm trying to make is on theta versus T, That is rate of change of theta with respect to time. Okay, well, let's move on. If this is the graph of omega versus t, okay. Um, and it kind of is that it kind of is because it's omega versus count to the end, which is increasing, whereas the time is decreasing, so that the slope of an omega versus t graph. What's the slope of the omega versus T graph tell you? Okay, now I'm not sure how much of that I recorded. I think I was recorded when I did this. If you got a theta versus T graph, 3000 degrees here, 150 seconds here, and the origins at zero, zero. Then you can draw a rectangle right here, and the slope is 20 degrees per count, the rise is 3000 degrees. That is 150 degrees. Well, at 30 degrees per count, we can do this half again as high and see where that line is parallel to the graph. In other words, that line has moved a little bit one way or another to the right or left. Eventually, it'll touch the graph as a tangent line and allows you to make these estimates. Okay. So that's Certainly possible. Now, omega is the slope of this graph. 
So at this point, if this 30 degrees per count is tangent at this point, then you can project down here and see that this is 150, that looks like about 40. So I would say that we hit 30 degrees per count at 40 counts. So anyhow, make the slope of this graph. That's the rate of change of theta with respect to time. If you have a formula, this thing, which you can get from the trend line, which I'll ask you to do, okay? Then you can take its derivative and get the theta that you would predict. But you're going to get a different result if you use a quadratic second degree polynomial or third degree polynomial. And both will fit the graph pretty well. Okay. Uh, and you can't really tell visually which one fits better. So you have to kind of compare that to other information. Okay. And I'll be more specific about that when I'm running instructions. Okay, so anyhow, if you do have an omega, I mean, the thing did have an angular velocity at every count. And let's just say it kind of did less. Let's assume it looks like this. Okay. Might be straight, might be concave up. They're just assuming concave down because maybe that's the way it'll turn out when you finally analyze this. Okay. Omega versus T. How would you measure how quickly omega is changing? What aspect of the graph would correspond to how quickly omega is changing? So the quick answer I got was the second derivative. Well, you're thinking second derivative of theta. Okay. And that could be done if you have a function, and I've already said this, but if you have a function, you can take the derivative of it. The actual function that governs this thing is governed by at least two factors that aren't linear. Okay? One of which can't even be idealized as linear, and the other turns out not to be linear, and we can tell that from the data, sort of. That's complicated. That's almost a semester long project to measure all that stuff. And eventually, we probably want to measure it electronically. Okay, the instruments we use were good, but you know, we can compare them with the electronic. No, compare favorably. You guys did a good job. Um, okay, so anyhow, what aspect of this graph then? So, the person said, second derivative. Oh, yeah, this is omega versus t. That's what we're asking about. So, well, the derivative, which would be the second derivative of this function. But the function is so complicated, you'll never take the derivative of it. You'll never even figure out how to write it down if you want to be really precise. You got to go to the data. Okay? Or you make better and better approximations. But you know, you get into heavy differential equations way beyond what you're going to learn in a sophomore course. Okay? Uh, so sometimes we've just got to deal with the data. And see what the data tells us. Maybe what the data tells us is best we can do is just try to predict as best we can where this is. It's not actually a second degree polynomial. It's not actually a third degree polynomial. Okay. It's got a lot of weird stuff in it that you don't know how to deal with, and maybe never will. Okay. Because reality is really elusive. Okay. Uh, okay, so um, the answer to this, first answer is the slope, okay? It's the derivative, if we're lucky enough, to have the right function. Okay? The, how quickly omega is changing is the angular acceleration. That's what acceleration is. Now, how quickly is not a rigorous definition. The rate of change of omega with respect to t is acceleration. 
got to talk about that in lab. So let me review what I told you in lab last time. And all this is very neat. If everything is a differentiable function, fine. Okay. Now, it's very close, and we can treat it as if it was, and we can answer a lot of good questions. Okay? We're not going to get into the... nasty differential equations. And some of the ones you're going to see in your differential equations, of course, a little nasty, but these are much nastier. Um, that, that you would have to use to model this thing honestly and the things you'd have to measure all over to them. Um any of that makes sense. In any case, if omega equals d theta dt, which corresponds to the idea that you can estimate where the thing is 90 degrees per count or 60 degrees per count or 30 degrees per count, okay, by looking at the slope, then you have a nice smooth function that you can take a derivative of. Yeah, you can get omega by this. And I'm going to ask you to put that into Excel and take the grip. That's really easy. Um, just a polynomial. And alpha is the omega dt. And that's what I was just talking about. This is how quickly the angular position changes. This is how quickly the angular velocity changes, right? Okay. Okay, then. Let's make the simplifying assumption that the angular acceleration is constant, which is pretty close to correct for this, but not totally. Okay. If the angular acceleration is constant, what's the omega? Well, we did this and I explained it in the lab, but I'm just going to do it quickly here. Um, alpha is the omega dt, and we saw in lab uh, that it follows that omega is the integral of alpha dt. People saw that. Okay. And if you integrate alpha dt and alpha is constant, alpha comes out of the integral, and the antiderivative dt, general antiderivative t plus c, so you get omega t equals alpha t plus c. If omega of z, well, omega of zero equals c, because if you replace t by zero, you get c. So we use omega naught instead of c. So we can write omega equals omega naught plus alpha t. So what's theta t? Well, omega equals d theta dt and so forth. Uh, so that theta t is the antiderivative of omega t dt. Okay, the general antiderivative of omega t is a general antiderivative of alpha t plus omega naught, which is one half alpha t squared plus omega naught t. Plus an integration constant that imitating what we did here, we'll call theta naught. Okay? That's it. There's the equations of linearly accelerated motion, except that uh, those are good equations. Notice that we can solve these equations for alpha. Okay? We solve either equation for alpha. We're not going to have time to go through the details of this. We'll do it next time. Um, we can solve any one of these equations for T. So, for example, if you know alpha and omega naught and t, of course, you can find omega, right? If you know omega at some time and alpha and you know omega naught, you can find what time that was, okay? There are four quantities in this equation, omega, alpha, t, and omega naught. If you know three of them, you can find the fourth one, okay? Now, there's another way I write these. Okay. 
and actually don't want to write this this way. Hey, I'm going to write this as delta theta, the change in theta, theta naught out to time t. How many different symbols are there in this equation? Show me with your fingers. Okay, let's see what four and I see four. Delta theta is a symbol. Delta is not a symbol. We know what that means. It's just delta theta, so it's just a quantity alpha t and omega naught, right? There are four equations that we can write of uh, this being one of them, of uh, this, well, this. Okay, this is one of your equations, there are four symbols. Okay. Um, and this is another one. And between these, all the symbols we need to model uniformly accelerated motion appear. The symbols are. These five. Okay. If you know any three of these, you can use these equations to find the other two. Okay. But there are two equations that we want to derive from this one and this one. It'll give us four equations that have the property that any three of these symbols, any three symbols you pick out of here, all appear in one of the equations. And the fourth symbol in that equation. To be solved for. Okay. So it's a nice, neat little package that you should pretty well, if you understand it up to here, then we're going to put that together into four equations and allow you to analyze any uniform accelerated motion. Also, they apply not just to rotating beams, but let's just say a ball. Rolling down a beam, constant slope. There's a constant acceleration there, but it's not a rotational acceleration. But the equations are identical, except the symbols are different. Instead of omega, which is angular velocity, we use v, which is a plain velocity. Okay. Instead of alpha, we use a, and so forth. So you get the equations for rotational motion, the equations for linear motion all in one fell swoop, okay? And then we'll start learning how to use those. I recommend you read through chapter three, just scan it, get some of the symbols in your head. And I'm not gonna sign anything until Wednesday.